Thank you so much for having me here today. Obrigada, gracias. I am so excited to be here in this spirit of learning, in the spirit of sharing. Uh, I have come here all the way from Sydney. It was very far. They made me wait in Santiago for nine hours while my luggage came here before I did. It's been an exciting trip with Latin American Airlines. Thank you so much for getting me here. Um, the talks that I give are very often practical and tactical, so I'm hoping to give you a lot of things that you can take to work and use on Monday. So why am I the right person to give you this talk? We've heard a lot of interesting things today. We've heard some very interesting things from Mark this morning about how we're a facilitator now. And I really agree with that. We are facilitators. We are designers as well. But now we have another job. We're actually coaches. We are coaches in our organizations and with our teams. So I'm going to tell you three things in my time with you today. And you might get a bonus thing as well. You never know how we go on time. The first thing I'm going to talk about is how did we get here? How did it turn into I was a designer, I am a designer, or a design researcher, and now I must be a coach? How did we get here? What is going on in our, in our organizations, in our industry? The second thing I'm going to talk about is a little about what is coaching? What is coaching in the context of design? How is it different from other things like mentoring or teaching? Um, and the third thing I'm going to talk about is some actual tools and techniques and tips and things that you can take away and use at work for you to become great design coaches as well. Now, why am I the right person to give this talk? So I teach at Sydney University, so I do a lot of coaching of students, especially first years, who think that their job at university is to come there and drink a lot rather than learn anything, which makes it hard. Um, I also, uh, you know, I run my own business as well, so I have people who work for me and I'm coaching them all the time and making sure that they're growing as designers. Um, personally, I play ice hockey and I ride horses, so I've been coached a lot and I know what makes a good coach too from, the, from my experiences on the other side. So let's do the first thing first. How did we get here? Design thinking. Okay, so... Throw up the horns for me. If, it, well, not yet, not yet. <laughs> Throw up the horns for me. If your organization or your client's organization has rolled out design thinking as the method that they're going to use now, and now everybody is a designer. Throw up the horns for me if that's happened to you. Ah, there's a fair few people who are dealing with this. Okay, those of you, those of you who have not had this, uh, it's coming. <laughs> so what I'm seeing in, in organizations um, that I'm working with, for example, um, you know, large banking organizations, they're taking their staff, people who are developers, product managers, uh, project managers, agile coaches, all of these people, they're throwing them into a design thinking workshop, giving them three hours of, you know, hexagons and things like that, and going, all right, now you're a designer. Everybody is a, d a designer, which is, that hurts a little bit. Um, Infosys, so very, very large Indian systems integrator. They've put all of their staff through design thinking. Consequently, everybody who works there now is a design thinker. Um, Pepsi, the CEO of Pepsi, Indira Naidu, she said to her staff, you have two to three years to adapt to our new design thinking culture. And if you don't, I will be happy to attend your retirement party. So these people are very serious about design in their organization. But what that means for us is um, it makes it difficult because everybody thinks that they can do what we do. And there are a lot of different flavors of design thinking. So we've got the IDEO model with the hexagrams, and we saw this in Mark's talk earlier. We've got the scribble model, how we go through all the scribble and we get to innovation. We've got the, the, the loop and the hills from IBM. They've got their own design thinking language. We've got all the d-school mindsets. So there's heaps of different ways. And we've got this one that's like a pyramid of design thinking, and I don't understand why it's a pyramid or 
why it even is like that. It makes absolutely no sense. But we have all of these kinds of flavors of design thinking that are being taught to people. And then when we come in there as the design professionals, people are like, oh, I know how to do that. Yeah, I, I can do the empathy thing. Yeah, I just like, I talk to some people. Okay, yeah, but did, what happened then? Did you, like, did you take the things you heard and do something with them? Oh, no, I just talked to some people, yeah. No, I talked to three people. That was totally enough. Psh. So these are, the, these are the exciting things that are happening for us. Everyone's a designer. Uh, and, and this is, it's a little hard to take, and we, we become a little bit like the sad baby, you know, <laughs> because... I'm the designer, um, everybody's touching my stuff, they're playing with my toys, these are my things um, that, that I, you know, that I do. This is what, I, I went to university for this, you know? Um, so it is, it's a little bit tough to take. Um, and it, but it, it, is, it is the right direction to go in, but it, it, is, it is difficult and we become a little like the sad baby. Um, we also have the situation where maybe people don't actually even understand what we do. So in our organisations, people are either being trained in design thinking so that, you know, they're designers too with their three hours or one hour of workshop experience, or they just don't know what we do at all. Um, and this is where coaching comes in as well. So we have the people who have got the very low level of skill um, from, you know, you're a design thinker now, and there's also the people who just don't understand what design is how it works, where it applies. They think that uh, we are crayon monkeys who come in with our box of crayons and colour stuff in when we say the word design. So those are the other people that we need to be design conscious for. So we have a couple of options here. Our options are, um, in this situation, you can, you can have a tantrum, you can throw your toys out of the pram, you can get cranky with everybody and say, that's my job, don't touch my stuff. Um, but one of my very favorite quotes from Mike Montero is, rolling your eyes is not a design skill. <laughs> Which I think is very apt and correct. It is, it is not helpful. Um, it doesn't get results. Uh, you just turn into that person that people don't want to work with anymore because you're that, you're that you're that designer who can't possibly design today because the sun has hit my screen at the wrong angle. You know, that kind of thing. So you can have a tantrum. That is an option. Or you can decide to become a coach. Like this excellent fellow, teacher. Um, very, very successful. Now, the power of coaching is you're creating an environment where people find their own answers. They find their own path to knowledge by you using a bunch of techniques, which I'm gonna talk about today, um, for them to figure it out for themselves. It's not about telling people what to do or teaching them. It's about helping them find their own expertise. So thinking on this, you know, everybody's gone to design thinking training. So my design team now must be awesome. This is my design team, oh my God. They're just, they're a bunch of professionals. They're gonna be incredible. They're gonna win the World Cup of Design for us. It's amazing. This is what you're probably thinking. If your whole organization has been trained to be designers, this is what you're working with. I am very sorry to tell you, this is not your design team. If this is the situation that you're in, this is your team. And I, I really hope that you see what I see in this picture, which is an incredible amount of enthusiasm, excitement for the things that they've learned, the things that you've, you know, they, they know how to use post-it notes now and like move them around. This sort of excitement and enthusiasm is fantastic, um, but they are completely out of control because they lack experience, they lack really solid understanding of process, um, but that doesn't mean that they don't have something to offer and to add. Because the more diverse thoughts that you can bring to a problem frames the solution that you come up with. If you bring five designers to a problem, you will get a very designy solution. If you bring a diverse group of people and use design tools to solve for the problem, you will get a better outcome for certain, because you will have more diversity of thought. So I really do hope that you see what I see in this, which is the enthusiasm and the potential. 
And what you need to do as a coach is to harness this potential and point it in the right direction so that you get great outcomes for your projects. So let's talk about what is coaching. Coaching, it's on an equal footing. You know how I was talking about you must find your own way to the knowledge, find their own answers? It's not about being more senior than someone. It's not about being better at something than someone. Coaching is about helping them find their own way to think creatively. So we use really open-ended uh, questions and open-ended techniques, similar to when we're interviewing, to, find, to allow them to, to get to, to the path, to walk the path themselves. The idea isn't that you, you walk it for them. You walk with them on the path so that they can come to their own understandings. And you want to help them to consider different perspectives. So also we heard from Mark as well, we heard the, the yes and. So coaching is, is really about that yes and. So building on uh, things that people are telling you, the ideas that they have, um, and being really expansive in your thinking. Ensuring that they're not just, if they're a developer that you're, you're coaching around design tools, making sure that you ask them really good open questions that makes them think differently than if they were trying to attack a code problem. So there's, that's the first thing about coaching. There's no seniority to it. The second thing, it's not mentoring. So coaching and mentoring kind of get mixed up quite a lot. Mentoring is something that has seniority implied, and the seniority is respected. Um, it's often around building skills. It's often around you know, maybe fitting in with organizational needs. So mentoring is a different prospect um, than coaching. And, men and as a mentor, it is actually your job to help that person with the answer because you know more than they do. Coaching, you're helping them get to the answer themselves. More often than not, there actually isn't a right answer. There's just the right answer for that situation at that time, in that context, for that person. So coaching is one of those things that you know, as, as designers, I don't know if people have done it to you, but when they say, so can you tell me the answer to blah, 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 and we just go, it depends. And we do that a lot. <laughs> but in coaching, it does. It depends. It depends on the person. It depends on their challenge. It depends on their context. It depends on their environment. And you're going to use very different um, techniques with one person than you would use with another person. Um, and it is. It's about uh, confidence building. That's the other thing. When you're, when you're coaching someone in using the tools of design, you're about building confidence because it's, it's easier for us who do it all the time to grab that whiteboard marker, walk up to the whiteboard and start drawing pictures to explain what we want. For somebody who doesn't do that every single day, it is more difficult. It is um, a, a very good friend of mine, Ben, um, he teaches sketch noting, and he says that um, the drawing on the whiteboard is like public speaking for the hand. Um, and I think that there are people who don't draw very often, and so when they get up there at the whiteboard or, or try to find the confidence to get up there, it's difficult for them because it is like public speaking for them. And you want to be able to give people the confidence to create a shared visual asset that helps us get to an understanding. You want to be able to give them the confidence to grab a bunch of post-it notes and just put some thoughts up or, or pick up a technique like, okay, well, let's, let's do, like, let's do some, some ideation. Let's do like 45 ideas in 10 minutes and see what we come up with. Give people the confidence to actually pick those great tools up um, and use them themselves. So it's not always like you facilitating everything. That's definitely a bonus. If you can coach people well, then they actually start to share that facilitator role. Um, and it's not always on us as designers. And we actually get some more space to do designing. So there's also not a, not a teaching and preaching design aspect to this. You're not, you're not about teaching people stuff. They can go to workshops for that. You're about giving them the confidence to use these tools on a day-to-day -day basis in the projects that you're working on together. Um, it's how we make sure that people understand what you use when to solve a problem. And this is, a, this is a, another really f fabulous thing that you can use in coaching, which is this whole idea of Zoom. And Mark was talking a little bit about this. And this is, 
this is, uh, you can zoom in on, on you know, service design blueprints and things like that, but you can sort of zoom in on, on problems as well. So you can zoom in and out on problems. And as a coach, you can help somebody who has less experience with design tools, less experience with using design to solve business problems, to look at things from the right level of Zoom, to like come into the very, very tight and detailed level, and also to be able to zoom back out to a much more macro level so they can actually see the whole of the problem rather than the smaller part. And it's definitely a, a great uh, method for being able to prioritize what's important in an overall um, problem that you're trying to solve. And you can help more junior humans to do this um, in the coaching context. So coaching is actually really aligned to user experience. I've gone back to like tools of the 1980s coaching, um, which will absolutely align to our process and methods, the way that we do design, uh, design work. And this is, the, this is a sort of model that is tried and trust, tested and really works for me. So this is called the GROW model. And this is, this is like, this is 1980s coaching. This is, this is not new. I'm not making this up. Um, what I'm doing is I'm finding a way to apply it to the context that we work in. So the GROW model, the way that it works is that you have, you start with a, a goal. So you want to agree on what the objectives are for coaching. You want to set long-term goals if you can. Um, and you need to maintain fluidity and flexibility in, in what those goals are. Um, and then you move on to what's the reality. So you've got, here's my goal. This is where I'm trying to go. What is the reality of the situation that I'm currently in? What is my current context? I want to learn this thing and I don't know how. My organization is not going to support me in what I'm trying to do. This organization doesn't have a culture that allows us to use design tools for, for problem solving. So what is the reality? And really making sure that you check what everybody's assumptions are. Then we move into creating options. So we invite suggestions in the coaching conversation. We say, you know, what are, the, what are the alternate things that you could think about to get to that goal via the reality that you're living in at the moment? Um, thinking through options and then choosing which one you're going to take as the way forward. And you wrap it up and create a way forward by committing to action, um, to making sure that the goals are SMART goals. And I'll explain SMART goals um, down the track a little. Um, and you want to really identify obstacles that that person is going to be facing in the coaching um, scenario and have ways that they can get around them, help them figure out what they can do to get past the things that are, in, that are their obstacles in their reality. And so this model, this is a really traditional standard, very well tried and tested coaching model, and it aligns to our experience design practice. Because if you think about the way that we usually do design, so we would uh, identify needs. So we've got our, you know, our goals and objectives. We would identify the needs. What are the needs that we're going to be solving for? Then typically, we would try and understand the current state. So we would look at that reality. What is the reality? So we understand the current state, what's happening um, in this design problem. Um, we, as designers, we create solution design. We create prototypes. We create those options. And then we um, ensure that in the, the, like the way forward, we prototype and we get feedback. So we test and we see whether or not what it is that we have is uh, useful and, and um, going to work. So you can see how like the coaching model and the experience design way of working are very well aligned. So you can, you can use this to, as one of the techniques. And you always want to be, so thinking about taking the role of coach, you want to be using these open and exploratory types of questions. So asking them to consider their issues, to consider their, the, the options that are available to them. What options do they have? What outcomes are they trying to create? Outcomes is a really great thing to try and nail down when you're talking to people about their objectives that, or the, the goals that you're going to put together as a coach and coach E. Um, what are the goals of the organization and project? That's kind of important. It's not just personal goals here. Um, you can challenge, have really good challenge questions. They might come up with an idea and you can say, well, what do you think the product owner's response to this solution would be? So they can start thinking through other people's perspectives. 
Um, and you know, what questions might other people have? How are the executives going to react to this? Um, what do we have to do to give them the answers you need? So you use these kinds of questions, but it's not your job to answer these questions. It's your job to help the person that you are coaching answer the questions themselves, to use the tools of design that they have perhaps had a, a cursory understanding of, and to help them get there themselves. Because it's very tempting as the expert to be the expert. Um, coaching can benefit everyone, and it doesn't just extend to people who are junior, it extends to your stakeholders, it extends to people who are in your teams, it extends to your clients. You can coach your clients. Sometimes they don't know you're coaching them. But if you're clever, you can coach your clients. <laughs> um, and it's, we're not in a situation now where we just build stuff and, and design stuff, and it's so fabulous that everybody just comes. We're in a situation where we have diverse skill sets, diverse teams, and people from all sorts of parts of the organization being part of what it is that is being designed. It's, it's not ours, we don't own it. Um, and I think that the more altruistic you can be with your knowledge um, and share it with other people, the better an outcome that you're going to get. You wanna win the hearts and minds of everybody. Um, there's, there's been many situations, and I think McKinsey has just spent a huge amount of time and money um, pulling together a report called The Value of Design in Business. Um, and if anybody's having trouble selling design in their organization, go Google that report and give it to your executives because basically it, they've done all of the work for you <laughs> um, to explain why it is valuable to use design to solve business problems. And you need to win hearts and minds of people. In some cases, people don't understand what we do. They don't understand the value and so you need to show. These are really good tips to stay in a coaching mindset. So you wanna spend a lot of time clarifying those goals. You definitely wanna know where you're headed with the person that you're coaching. Don't let them seduce you into being the expert. It is so easy to be the expert. Um, it's very important that you are allowing them to find their own answers. Don't give them the answers because you just know. Help them find it themselves. Um, you've got to watch out for those loaded questions. We are, you know, if you've done experience design research, you know how it is to ask a question that's loaded. You want to be able to answer, ask, ask the questions of your coaches in a way that is neutral and in a way that allows them to come to a determination themselves. And look for the loaded silence as well in the coaching conversation because that can be a learning moment. Somebody could be quiet and learning something. So you don't have to fill the space all the time. Um, watch out for colluding. So an example of colluding is if, say, they're telling you a story of, there was this time when I, you know, I was, I'm trying to do this thing at work and, and my boss has told me that I can't do it. And then you go, oh, yeah, that happened to me and this is what I, had, what I did. And that's, it's very easy to, um, to sort of start colluding with a story that somebody's telling you. You want to stay neutral. Coaching is really neutral. Um, and allowing them to figure it out themselves without putting any of your bias on it, any of your you know, particular uh, personal experiences on it. And when you're using that GROW model to structure your coaching conversations, you don't necessarily have to do it in order. It is really good to have your goals and objectives, but sometimes you might need to look at the reality first before you can set your goals and objectives. So those are the, the coaching mindset um, tips to help you make sure that you're actually coaching, not telling somebody what to do. So let's talk about a couple of techniques. So SMART goals, I talked about SMART goals a little bit earlier. Um, SMART goals is a way of creating a really good, structured and measurable um, method of seeing whether or not you're reaching the goal that you've set for yourself. So SMART, it's, it's an acronym. Again, we're reaching back into like 1980s coaching here and applying it to the modern day. Um, there's wonderful things from the 1980s, like, you know, aha and <laughs> bubble skirts. <laughs> um, okay, back to SMART goals. So uh, SMART goals. So SMART goals are specific. What do you want to achieve? Where? How? When? With whom? What are the conditions and limitations? Why do I want to reach this goal? Um, are there other alternative ways of me reaching this goal? So really being very specific in what it is that you're trying to achieve and why you're trying to get there. You also want um, your goals to be measurable. What will you, and this isn't just like in numbers or, or things like that, 
What will you see? What will you hear? What will you feel? How will you be different when you reach this goal? What evidence do you need to know about that? What's the, what's the physical manifestation of this goal? Do, do I, will I be in a different place? Will I feel different? Uh, will I have a different organisational construct around me? How will you measure? How will you measure whether or not you've achieved this goal? Attainable. You would really want to make sure that you actually set yourself up for success or set your coachee up for, for success. So you want to weigh up that time and effort. Does it make sense for me to put in the effort, the energy, the time, the effort, the money, whatever it is, the sacrifices, uh, or my coachee, for the, your coachee, the sacrifices that they might need to make to reach this goal? And make sure that it is actually something that's attainable. If you don't have the time, the money, or the talent, or your coachee doesn't have the time, the money, or the talent to reach the goal, then they will fail. So thinking about this before you set out on the journey um, will be much more successful in the long run. You want your goals to be relevant. Is it actually relevant to you? If you are a, um, a designer, and the goal that you have is you want to, um, you know, write lines and lines of code, um, is it actually relevant to your current situation? Is it actually going to achieve something for you in your, in your context? Um, if you're lacking certain skills, then you can plan training. If you lack resources, then you can look at how to get from them. So you just have to make sure that you're actually choosing a goal, or your coachee is choosing a goal, for, that is something that is relevant to their context, that will matter that when they get there. Um, and really, as a coach, your job is to closely question, why do you want to reach this goal? What is the motivation? What is actually going on behind this that you want to get to where you want to get to? And timely. You need to make a tentative plan for everything that you're going to do. And I'm going to show you a little bit of a coaching plan in a second. Um, deadlines are great. Deadlines make people switch into action. Um, I, w I read a wonderful blog article all about procrastination. Um, and basically, we are all generally driven by what is called the inf uh, instant gratification monkey. And the instant gratification monkey is the thing that we do that makes us feel better straight away, but does not actually achieve what it is that we're supposed to be doing. And we don't start doing what we're supposed to be doing until the panic monster turns up, and the panic monster usually turns up in the form of a deadline. Now, a deadline will get people into action, so having timeliness around the goals that you set um, will ensure that you actually do get there. And keep it realistic, keep it flexible, um, so that everybody's morale stays high, because you don't want the person that you're coaching to just to lose the will to live because they cannot get to the goal that you've set to them. So those are the SMART goals. So SMART goals and coaching work really well together. Um, there's a couple of other techniques that I think are really super valuable. Appreciative inquiry is another one, and I, uh, it's a, another coaching conversation structure. So this, if you're going to be coaching somebody in design uh, tools, in design methods, in applying design to problems, you can use appreciative inquiry to build that rapport with them and form the goals. Appreciative inquiry is a method that, that treats things as a mystery to be explored rather than a problem to be solved. Um, and it's a very open and uh, open-ended and, and kind type of conversation. And it goes like this. It's very, very simple. And I'll, I'll tweet out actual questions um, for you so that you can take it and use it yourself. So when you're doing coaching, you, uh, the conversation starts. It's like you ask your coachee um, to think about their achievements. What have they done in the past that can contribute to the goals that they're talking about? Ask them to choose one of those times and then tell a story about it. So give me an example. Tell me the story of when you achieved that thing. Elicit from that the personal qualities that allowed them to be successful. What was it about how they did it, what they do, how they approach things that allowed them to be successful so that they've got a positive, uh, a positive starting point for their achievements already? Then what you want to do is you want to take them into the future and you want to talk to them about what does the future look like? How is it different from now? What have you achieved? What is different? What do we have to, you know, what are, what are the, the things that you see, feel, and hear that make that a different type of future? And then you want to bring them back to the present and near future to think about what can they do right now to start reaching for that future they just described for you. 
So it's a really good conversation structure for coaching. And also, as, as a side tip, this works beautifully for stakeholder interviews. If you ever have to interview stakeholders as you're going into a project and you want to try and figure out what's going to make a project successful, you can use appreciative inquiry for that. So you, you, know, you talk to them about, when did a project go really, really well? Tell me what you contributed to that that made that project go so well. Um, and then, you know, what does, what does the future of this project look like? Okay, what do we need to do right now for this project to be successful? So it's a really good f structure for those kinds of conversations where you're trying to elicit things from people. So it has a coaching, um, it comes from coaching, but you can use it everywhere. And you want to plan for coaching as well. This is the other very important thing. So you want to create a design coaching plan at the outset of your project at the outset of as soon as you notice that there is a need for coaching in your organisation. And you can use the GROW model to that. And I've, I've deliberately kept this very, very simple um, for people to use. Let's, let's ground it in an example. OK. And I'm sorry if there's developers in the room, but I'm going to shit on you a little bit now. So. <laughs> OK, so who knows this developer who, when you take a lot of time and effort to design something a particular way. Um, you test it with people. You make sure that it's going to work. You give it to the developer, and the developer goes, no, nah, I think I'm going to change that. <laughs> Horns for that one? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yep, OK, double horns there. Um, so look, we love this developer. They make our dreams real, OK? We can't do shit without them. But. Um, there is a need for us to coach that person to understand why we've done things the way that we've done it, why we've made the decisions that we have, why we've designed things in, in a particular way, and that, do you know what? We tested it with humans, so we know it works. Um, why they don't get that is a mystery to me. But anyway, um, you can plan for this. You can plan to solve this using coaching. So if we use the GROW model in this kind of context, for example, you would say the goal would be the developer will understand why you design things the way that you do. The reality is that they make changes without understanding why you design things a particular way. What you want to do is you want to come up with what are your options to help you get to that goal, that they will understand why you have designed things the way that you have done. And the way forward in the GROW model is the coaching plan. And the coaching plan is super simple. It looks like this. You can do it in a little table. What are the activities that you can do with this person in order for them to get towards their goal? What are the success metrics that you will be able to measure to see whether or not they're actually moving towards the goal that you've set? Which roles are involved in the project? Is it uh, the designer? Is it the developer? Is it everybody? And when in the project is it the right time to do this? So do you do it at the start? Do you do it in the middle? Do you do it in the finish? Do you do it all the way through? So if you start a project and think about what, what do people need to know in my team about design or be coached on in the tools of design for business problem solving, and how am I going to plan for that? So an example for this in this particular context for, uh, say, you know, the developer, so an activity that you could do with that developer is take that developer along to a testing session and have them observe people using the thing that you designed and see why you have designed it the way you have. Why, if something was working, you kept it. Why, if it wasn't working, you changed it. What would be the success metric? The developer stops changing your stuff. Um, the roles that are involved is yourself, the developer, and the place and time when you would do that is probably from the, the you know, towards the, the end where you've got the, not towards when, towards the, the uh, start of the prototyping phase, perhaps, if that's what you're doing. Another great way of coaching by, a little bit by stealth is to have people participate in the research so that they hear things themselves um, and then, it, you know, they will form quite fast opinions on stuff that they hear. That it's a bit of a double-edged sword bringing non-researchers to research sessions. First of all, it's great because they hear things with their own ears uh, and they can then use you know, that information to, to make uh, human-centered decisions going forward in the project. But the problem with it as well is because they're not trained as researchers, they don't know that hearing something once doesn't make it so. You do actually have to hear something 
quite a few times, and then you need to triangulate your research results to ensure that what six people said is true for a statistically significant sample size. So because they don't know that, um, that's where the double-edged sword comes in. But I think it is hugely valuable if you can coach them on uh, having a, a research mindset and involving them so that they're listening to the people that you're designing for. There's more, the, it outweighs, the benefits outweigh the, the difficulty in then teaching them about research triangulation. But yes, the executives then they'll hear something from one person and for the rest of the project, all you'll hear is like, oh, you know that dude in the green shirt who said that thing? And like, that's the thing that we have to do for this whole project, because that, that guy said it. And then everybody who researches sort of sighs and is a bit sad. Um, but it's our job as coaches for them to see why it's important to hear that then from like, you know, 200 other people via a quantitative study. So this is how you would put together a very, very basic coaching plan using the GROW model. Now let's, let's talk a little bit about this coaching by stealth. Um, so the example that I've given you, that developer doesn't necessarily know that you're coaching him. And I, I would put this out for your consideration. You know, is it ethical to sort of coach somebody and not really tell them that you're coaching them? Because coaching, like, it is implicit in it that there is an agreement between the coach and the coachee that they are actually, you know, being coached. Um, so sometimes it's, the, it's a better thing to do um, in that situation to use a, another um, leadership and management model, um, which uh, the very lovely Kim Goodwin made me aware of in a workshop many, many years ago, which was, um, it has been my guiding star for feedback ever since, which is the situation behavior impact feedback model. Um, the way that that works as a, as a tool, and this is also, you can use this in coaching as well, is, is here is the situation that I saw. Here's the situation that we're in. The behaviour that I observed from you was this. The impact of that behaviour was this. Was that what you're actually going for? If not, maybe we could do something different. How do you think we could do that? So, for example, um, we were in a meeting with all of the people today and the behaviour that I observed from you is you kept talking over the top of uh, Janet. The impact of that behaviour is that Janet stopped talking and contributing to the meeting. Was that what you were going for? Because if so, you know, achieved. But if not, then perhaps there was a better way that you could have behaved. And you can use situation behaviour impact to work with people who you think need coaching so that they actually get a good understanding of what the, what the, the outcomes of their behaviour are. Um, but I think that the best thing to do uh, with any kind of project is to just, at the outset of your project, to really start to think about what is it that these people need from me as a design coach in order for them to contribute to this project, to contribute to our problem solving, using tools of design in a meaningful way. Thinking that out at the start of your project is a really powerful way to set yourself up for success and allow everybody to contribute. Um, so yes, I think that there is there's some some funny waters to navigate in using coaching in this way, where we have to figure out: um, uh, do we let people know that we're coaching them? Do we just sort of coach them? Um, but I think it's it is a, an interesting set of tools and techniques that you can use um, in order to get great things from the people that you're working with. So the key takeaways from this talk: successful coaching is absolutely about showing where the path is and supporting people along the way. Not leading somebody down it, not walking the path for them, not giving them the answers. It's about helping them find their own expertise. That's the, and I think that is the most important thing to remember about coaching anybody. They are trying to find their own expertise and you are facilitating the process for them to get there. You want to be able to build rapport with whoever you are coaching at the outset of it. So you use appreciative inquiry to do that. Appreciative inquiry is that conversation structure which is super interested in what people have to say um, and thinks that they're a fabulous mystery that you want to explore further. Um, and that builds you up for success if you have that rapport at the beginning of any kind of uh, coaching that you do. And coaching is a conversation. It goes in two directions. It's a dialogue, the coach 
and the individual, they interact in a really dynamic ex exchange to achieve goals, to enhance performance, to move people forward. What you're really trying to do is you're trying to help them achieve goals. Um, there's no point in having extended conversations that go around and around in circles. And as a good coach, you have to notice when you're, you know, whatever you're doing or talking about is a dead topic, um, and perhaps you need to approach it in a different way. Other key takeaways. Resist that temptation to be the expert, because it's so fun when you know the answer to things, and other people don't. But your job, again, is to help them find their expertise. You don't want to answer the questions for them because how does that help them grow? How does that teach them? How does that teach them? And you've got to be very clear on the goals that you and your coachee have. You want to make them smart. You want to make them specific, measurable, attainable. The R1 and timely. What was the R1? It's gone out of my head now. Ah, it'll come back. <laughs> Realistic. Thank you. Um, yeah, because, uh, you know, a nice, big, clear target is easier to hit than something that's really small and fuzzy. And closing it out, what makes a really good coach? Complete dedication to your cause. It's an altruistic thing to do. It is a generous thing to do. It is a kind thing to do. It is something that helps all of the boats in the ocean rise up not leaving somebody to sink and going, you don't know how to be a designer, you can stay down there. If we coach people to use the tools of design in business to solve business problems and bring diversity of thought to everything that we have to deal with, and we deal with some really complicated stuff, we will get better government, we will get better design, we will get better services, we will get better products. If we bring all of the thought, all of the, the power of, of who we are as humans and what we can do to the problems and use tools of design to do it, then we will absolutely achieve the best outcome possible. Um, it's, too, it's too hard for designers to do this stuff alone, um, and you don't have to. But what you do have to do is help people use what we have and what we know to be successful in all of the business problems that we tackle. Thank you so much for spending time with me today. I'm really happy to take some questions. I can take questions in all of the languages. There's one there. Olá, Kátia. Olá. Uh, se me permite, duas perguntas. Uh... Um momento. Um momento. Alô. I said... Alô, alô. Oi. Yep. Go uh, ahead. Me permite, duas perguntas. A primeira, além do modelo Row e das premissas do Smart, que outras referências você já testou ou acredita que pode funcionar principalmente para estimular o, o senso, a importância de compartilhar conhecimento e trabalhar colaborativamente. Por exemplo, Shu Hari, ou o modelo Dreyfus de aquisição de skills, de conhecimento. E a última pergunta, me compartilhe conosco okay. alguma uma situação, o que você usou para convencer uma gest um gestor, um, um gerente que hum. não conhecia nada do assunto ou simplesmente não acreditava no valor do coaching, das atividades de coaching. O que, que você usou para convencê-lo, para ele apoiar, para ele patrocinar as atividades? Yeah. God, don't we all have that? <laughs> okay. Um, so there's two, two bits in there. Okay, so one, one is sort of what is the... Where, where has this worked? What, and what else have I used that has worked um, previously with, uh, with coaching? So let me, let me answer that one first. So the GROW model is, it, I use that one primarily because it is so easy. Um, it's easy to form a plan off the back of it um, and it's easy to understand. You can say, this is, these are the four things that we're going to do and this is how we're going to achieve those. Um, I think that use it, you need to use them in, in conjunction. So there were three coaching tools that I talked about. One is the GROW model 
One is the smart goals, like how you actually construct a goal, that's quite important. And one is the appreciative inquiry. And I think the appreciative inquiry is, is a super important one not to forget. Um, and I think the other, you can apply a lot of things from design research in just si simply in the way that we interview, simply in the way that we ask a question. That is very applicable to coaching conversations as well. Um, so I would look to tools of design to coach with, if that makes sense. Um, in terms of the convincing people, yeah, so the key way to get anybody across the line is to have them empathise with the humans that you're trying to m design for or make a better future for. Um, easiest ways to do that is to have them interact with those humans or watch you interact with those humans. So. For example, I did some work with a large banking client in Australia, and we were looking at the point in time, what does the bank do when somebody dies? How do they, how do they manage that process? How do they treat the people who are involved in it, the people who are the bereaved people, the people who have been left behind? Um, and the way that I got them across the line with that one, because they were very focused on, oh, well, we've got, you know, the law and we need these things and somebody's dead and we need the certificates and, and this is the checkboxes that we have to go through. And I had them sit in on interviews where we talked to people who had been bereaved and they talked about their experience with the bank and how awful the bank had made it for them. Um, and I think that was one of the most powerful empathy moments um, in 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 the career that I've had so far. Um, but it's, it, it is the key. Have them interact, have them watch you interact if they're not capable of doing it themselves um, to get them to understand why it's important. Other questions? This, hey. This. Hello? 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 Am I looking in the right direction? No, behind you. <laughs> Over here. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, Sorry, it might be a bit similar question to the previous sure. one. Um, I was wondering if um, for this presentation um, of, and for your work, mostly because I, I think you apply this in real life Every day. client situations. And um, I was just wondering what, what um, if there are previous uh, research um, combining uh, coaching and design thinking. Um, if you, what are, what are your references for, for? Yeah, I think there's, there's some really good corporate examples of where that's been done. And I think that if you look to the organizations that are successful in applying design thinking throughout the organization, for example, Pepsi, one of the ones I talked about before, they have been very successful in applying design thinking to their entire organisation. Um, there's a, a reference article for that. There's one in the Harvard Business Review from about a year or so ago, um, an interview with Indira Naidu, and she talks about how she uh, implemented design thinking within her executive team and the things that she asked them to do, how they did it, um, what they didn't do, um, she had a, quite a few men in her executive team and the story that she told was she gave them empathy building homework and apparently most of these executive men took it home and gave it to their wives to do, which was, you know, not what she was after. But uh, she tells a, a really good story about how that organisation has used design thinking and how they coached their executive team to develop that mindset um, and that would be a, a really good place to start. I can tweet that article. Oh, yeah. yeah, thanks. So, so I, I should be looking up in um, uh, business coaching or executive coaching yeah, or I team think, coaching? Yeah, team, I think it's, it's less the sort of business coaching. It's more around, definitely around the, the things that underpin team coaching. Team coaching. Yeah, and the things that underpin um, organisational change as well. So, the, but that's a whole, like a whole nother talk to talk about how we do org change with design. <laughs> uh, no, I was just but, wondering because uh, uh, I, I recently finished a coaching mm. uh, uh, program, and um, yeah, I was just want, uh, thinking like, what are the, what is the link between coaching and design? Yeah, and, I, definitely, yeah. Is, it's in those very soft uh, team skills. I think that 
you should be looking to the materials that, that you got from there, I'd say. But I'll tweet out some articles, and the Harvard Business Review has got quite a good set of articles on this, and I'll make sure you can tweet those as references to have a look at. Yep. Other okay. questions? Okay. I'm, I'm this way now? Gotcha. <laughs> I, can, I can see the shadow of you. <laughs> Olá, Cristiano Fernandes. Just one uh, second. Eu no meio de um processo... <gasps> I broke it. Sorry. <laughs> I broke it. <laughs> tá tudo bem. Obrigada. <laughs> okay. Let's start again. É, Katia, é, primeiro, prazer em te conhecer. Uh, eu estou no meio de um processo, né, de um treinamento de, de coaching. Estou é, bem apaixonado por esse assunto, então encaixou bem aqui no momento. É, o processo, para mim, too. a parte mais difícil é o processo de conexão. É, eu queria que tu falasse um pouquinho para a gente, um pouquinho, qual é o ambiente ideal né, para a gente fazer essa conexão, se é individual, se é realmente um para um, é, e se você usa alguma técnica específica de rapport, enfim, para se conectar com essas pessoas. E se não for muito aí, complementando, se você fez alguma formação específica aí na Austrália. Muito obrigado. Hum. Um, oh, great. Yeah. So, the coaching, coaching is usually and more, most successfully one-to-one. -one. Absolutely. Um, if you are doing one-to-many, then you're not coaching, you're training. Um, so, I would say that if you want to coach, if you want to really say that you're coaching somebody, then you would be doing that one-to-one. -one. Um, there are so many places that you can learn basic coaching techniques. There is no place that says, here is the coaching technique and here's how you apply it to design or to, you know, to business. You need to make that connection yourself. So um, there's, there's a billion online resources that you can go in and uh, learn, you know, these appreciative inquiry, go model, other coaching models. This is the one that I chose because I think it's the most simple to use. Um, but there are a bunch of other coaching models and, and leadership tools as well. There's, there's tools where you uh, work with people to understand. And when I was talking about the helicopter zooming in and zooming out, it's a technique called up on the balcony, down on the dance floor. So the, the really great thing about uh, working through problems and figuring out you know, what to do about something or how to apply knowledge, if you can, you need to know when you've got to be up on the balcony, zoomed out and looking down on everything, or down on the dance floor, uh, in amongst it, you know, doing the bop and figuring out on a very detailed and tactical zoomed in level what has to be done. So learning all of those kinds of techniques is, it's a straightforward thing to do, and there's a lot of materials online, things that are free, things that are on Udemy um, that you can use to get there. The connection between how you take that and apply that in the context where you have a group of people who have a limited knowledge of designs to solve problems or has done a course but they don't really know what to do with it yet, that you need to make that connection yourself through your understanding of design and your understanding of coaching. Um, that's a really good question, and it's probably something that I should think about and write a blog article on. I will take that as an action. Others? You good? <laughs> <laughs> 